it is easy to yeah. pass along to our kids something that will distract them for hours. It really makes your life easy. You know, I mean, you can go do a lot of things, yeah. but the pain in the end, and I've, I've done this on my own podcast, talk to experts who are actually knowledgeable doctors in this. And they've given me the best piece of advice they said is when you see how kids react when they've come off the device and they're so hyper, it's because of what's happening in their brain as a result of all of that screen time. And that's all I needed to know to say, okay, it's going to be great for like an hour, but then it's going to be misery for three hours because they're going to have this regression of emotion because they've just gotten off their crack device. And so we're not all, I mean, there's no way to do this perfectly. Just like personal trainers that do walk the walk that they have, you know, days where they eat a bowl of ice cream and a half a pizza. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Parenting Teens Today with Jesse LeBeau. All right, and we're back. Everybody, I'm so excited to introduce my newest friend here. I don't know if she considers me a friend yet. I might be uh, getting ahead of myself. But Lynn Smith, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, round of applause. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It's great to be with you, Jesse. Yes, a friend indeed. <laughs> and where, out of curiosity, are you located in the world? We actually are in South Carolina. So we were one of those COVID families. This might speak to your audience. Some people might have done this. We were yeah. in Atlanta for years when I was with CNN Headline News and I was in New York before that. And we have two little boys and we wanted to be by the water and just appreciate nature after we're going through COVID and knowing what it was like to do the opposite. So we live on the coast of South Carolina now. Wow. Loving it out there. Yes. What a beautiful place to be. And also the kids, like they fish and they run around <laughs> outside. It's like, it's a novel idea these days, isn't it? It's like 1995 out here. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> Going back in time. I, uh, I go back to Alaska where I grew up and it really does feel a lot of times like I'm back in time. I'll be like in a small town and there it's like the plane's supposed to leave at a certain time. And you're kind of like, what's going on? I don't see a plane. And they're like, oh yeah, it's on the way. Like whenever it gets here, then, you know, we'll figure it out. It, it, it is kind of a, it is kind of it's, different, right? It's so funny. You saying you're from Alaska. So my boys love outdoor boys and the, he's from Alaska and they do yep. all of these different activities outside. And I think it's something that's such a lost art with this generation, every age group that it's just sitting on the couch on your iPad or whatever it is. And when you really see the benefits of just getting your kids out in nature, it is yeah. mind blowing the impact. Hopefully the pendulum swings back because it, that's something we talk about all the time on here is phones and social media and how it's just numbing out everyone's brain, giving them TikTok brain. So the fact, the, the biggest thing I always look for is people who walk the walk because everyone has got a podcast like this and is talking these things. And then you look at their life and it's kind of like the, the trainer that you go to who's overweight. And you're like, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't know a lot about training and I should probably get out of my own way, but I kind of feel like I'm going to respect the person more if they actually do the work they're sure. doing the push ups, And then they're being like, yeah, and you, and you need to do it too, as opposed to just saying it. Cause you know, the pain of it. You know, it, yeah. it is easy to yeah. pass along to our kids something that will distract them for hours. It really makes your life easy. You know, I mean, you can go do a lot of things, yeah. but the pain in the end, and I've, I've done this on my own podcast, talk to experts who are actually knowledgeable doctors in this. And they've given me the best piece of advice they said is when you see how kids react when they've come off the device and they're so hyper, it's because of what's happening in their brain as a result of all of that screen time. And that's all I needed to know to say, okay, it's going to be great for like an hour, but then it's going to be misery for three hours because they're going to have this regression of emotion because they've just gotten off their crack device. And so we're not all, I mean, there's no way to do this perfectly. Just like personal trainers that do walk the walk that they have, you know, days where they eat a bowl of ice cream and a half a pizza. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> We've seen the walk sweet days. That's yeah. Exactly yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, um, it's certainly an interesting one. That's what I heard for years and years is parents would always talk about, it's like he becomes a totally different teenager, totally different kid when he, when we make him get off the video games. Like he's, he's shorter tempered, he's rude, he's disrespectful. It's like he becomes another person. And you hear that enough times and you're like, 
okay, there's clearly something going on here. And then when you talk to some people that have looked into the science behind it, you're like, oh yeah, maybe this isn't so good. And like you said, it's one hour of free time for you, but then three hours of nightmare afterwards. Not worth it. (laughs) I've experienced it because yes, I too have been tempted. It's easy in car rides. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah. Give them the iPad, turn on the TV. You're good to go. Exactly. So you have so many amazing things going on. You're helping parents. You're helping entrepreneurs. Uh, I want to get into all of that, but first, could you give us a little bit about your background and how you came to be doing all the things that you're doing? Sure. I was a news anchor for 15 years, news anchor and journalist, storyteller, um, NBC, MSNBC, and then most recently CNN Headline News. And in the pandemic, I had the opportunity to, as many of us did, I'm sure people listening to this had that flashpoint of, am I really doing, if this is my last day on earth, am I really doing what I feel like is making the most impact and changing the lives of the way that I potentially could based on the skill set that I have? And what I realized is that there were so many people out there that lacked the confidence to do the thing like start the podcast or write the book, or maybe it's for some of those parents of teens, it's go back to work after being home with the kids after so many years, or the confidence to sort of put themselves out there in a new way after being in mom or dad mode for so long. And so um, (laughs) when I started working with people in, in building that confidence, I saw that we're all the same. We all have a version of imposter syndrome, whether it's in business or in parenting, we have a version of imposter syndrome that tells us either why why me or I'm really going to screw this up. And so I wanted to reverse engineer the skills that I had as a news anchor to be an effective communicator to help others to realize that that voice that they have, that only they have, that story that they have, the voice, the message is going to impact the masses if they follow the formula that I had to follow in order to lead to a successful career as a news anchor. Because I wasn't good in the beginning, I'll tell you that. I had lots of people tell me how bad I was. And so I (laughs) needed to be able to create that formula to become good. Do you feel like it is harder today because there is, like you said, you heard from people that you could be better or you weren't doing a good job. But today, I mean, I've seen it in my algorithm before where it's like the newscasters, the news reporters that mess up and say the wrong word or think they're off camera. And and it can completely make you uh, uh, famous, if you will, but for all the wrong reasons. Do you think that is something that holds people back because of the judgment and fear of failure and other people chiming in on the internet? Yeah. I mean, I think that it could be your mother-in-law. I mean, it could be your neighbor that's telling you that they (laughs) saw you the other day and they saw him screaming at your kid, you know, like it's all around us. People have their opinions and they either post it on your feed anonymously. And it's a lot easier to do that than to say it to someone's face. And likely they'd never say it if they could hide behind it or if they couldn't hide behind a computer screen. But it's, it's really, this is the key lesson in that is that when we don't seek external validation and we only seek internal validation, our confidence will increase (laughs) because it's Mm. impossible to get the, what we need from external validation. It's what made social media successful. How many likes do I have? How many comments do I have? They built an entire product off of this human behavior of needing external validation. But when you make that shift and you know, if you're listening to this and you're thinking about what it is that you want to do and it's something that's holding you back, go internal. Don't go outside and see if everyone thinks you're good at it. Go inside and be like, why me? Not why me? It's why me? Yeah. Yeah. There is a reason that I have, you know, this great method that's helping my kids or this great message that would impact another entrepreneur, my coworker. And so it's really a shift in mindset as everything is in our life, right? We have to shift our mindset in order to be successful. And I think that that's the biggest mistake people make is they think that there's some sort of quick fix and it's not, it's in your control. You can't get that externally. (sighs) Man, I love this so much. One of the biggest things that we talk about with the kids and families we work with is confidence. Confidence is the key for so many kids. And and I hear you saying that. And it's so funny because of all these life lessons and things we work on in the program, 
it's like geared towards kids. But I always laugh because I'm like, I get so much out of this and it is the exact same thing for adults. And I think sometimes we miss that. And especially as kids look at adults, it's like, oh, you, you know, you got it all together. You got your, your good career. You got your good life. You got it all figured out. But the truth is, and I, I would imagine you feel the same way. I, I've met, you know, people that are the most successful and mm-hmm. famous and we're all just trying to figure it out. You know, I met, I spent time with very wealthy, you know, the 1% of the 1% wealthy people during the pandemic and they're depressed and having a hard time. And it's like, it is hard to be a teenager. It's hard to be an adult. It's just hard to be a person, but kind of like what you were saying earlier is you get to choose your heart. Is the heart going to be fighting your kid on the front end and not giving him the Mm -hmm. device? or the video game, or fighting it on the back end when he's being influenced by all these things, wasting all his time, doesn't have a good relationships with kids and anxiety and stress. You get to choose which hard, and, and I hope people will choose the one that ultimately does the most to prepare their kid for life. So I appreciate that so much, the confidence. And, and can we dig into confidence here because it's such an important piece of everything that we do. Confidence is the true belief that you can do anything despite any circumstance. Yeah. So you fail at something, you're confident, you pick yourself up and you keep going. Arrogance is believing you're good at everything. So there's a really big difference and people struggle with that because they're like, well, I don't want to be overly confident because I don't <laughs> want to seem arrogant. And I was like, well, are yeah. you an arrogant person? No, like you don't think you're good at everything. So let's let's talk about that with parenting because I know I struggle with this. Yes. I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old, both boys, both highly competitive boys, play a lot of sports. If they don't win, they feel so down. And I've seen, not from my own parenting expertise because I am so far from a parenting expert, but hosting two podcasts, I've talked to so many experts on this topic. And here's what I've taken away from it that I hope your listeners, I hope it changes because it's changed it for me, yeah. is it's not about teaching your kids how to win at everything or how to feel good all the time. Like, no, you're great. You're great. You know, it's kids yeah. bullying. Oh, no, you're great. It's you yeah. can do anything despite any circumstances because you're strong, you're resilient. Mm-hmm. Do you know what that means, right? And teaching them that core principle of what is resiliency. It's a big word for kids, but what does it mean to just keep going? And it's those three words that, and I know it impacted my career, but I don't know if people at home and they're listening and saying, you know, there were times in my life where I just had to keep going. That was the only option. And it turned out okay. If we can teach that to our kids, that's going to be the game changer. I love that. Yeah. It's with kids so much. I hear from parents like, I can't get them to do this and I can't get them to go to school. They've missed 50 days of school this year. And it's like looking at it as an adult, you're kind of like, do you know how many things I do every day that I don't want to do? I don't want to get up as early as I do. I don't want to eat the foods that I, that I eat. I don't want to go and exercise. I don't want to talk to half the people that I talk to, but that's kind of a part of life. And so you better start learning to do things you don't like now. Uh, So you're, you're speaking. Better start getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And it happened this morning. My son was all curled up on the couch with our dog and he looked so happy and he was like, I don't (laughs) want to go to school, mom. I just want to stay home with you. And, and the helicopter mom and me wanted to be like, you know what, let's just skip school. And then the mom and me was like, you know what, buddy, I totally get it. Like, I don't want to do some things at work today either. Like there's some meetings that I don't want to have to do. It's like, but I have some responsibilities and I'm going to try and find the best piece of those meetings that I'm going to like. So what are you excited about to go to school today? Like, what's going to be fun? He's like, well, PE recess. And I was like, cool. I can't wait. When you get home, I want to hear about that. Tell me, tell me what's going to be fun about it. So we have something to look forward to. And that's the whole thing that we can do for ourselves, right? Like, oh, I don't feel like getting out of bed. Okay. Well, what's one thing that I am looking forward to about today? It's a mindset yeah. shift and it's yeah. really powerful once you practice it. Huge, whether it's with kids, parenting, or entrepreneurship. I'm curious for you, how did you, for parents listening, how do you balance being so busy doing the things that you're doing? Because you're wearing many hats as mom and and CEO and face of companies. How do you toe that line with two boys? 
Uh, I say I don't do it all. I do it the best that I can to the best of my ability. And I do what I can based on a system that works for me, meaning I have my wants, can'ts, and cannots. <laughs> so I have the things that I want to do, the things that I need to do, and the things that I cannot do. The needs to do has to get done first. I have yeah. to be the best mom that I can be. I have to be the best wife I can be. I, and I say have to, but I want to as well. But then there are the wants. You know, I want to be able to spend more time on a book that I'm working on, or I want to be able to spend more time with friends. And that comes second. And then third, it's the nose. It's the ability to be like, nope. I can't do that. And that's the hardest piece for working parents that I've heard. I don't know if it's true for people listening, but people that I've talked to are just like, I don't know how to say no. I feel like a failure if I'm saying no. Yeah. I feel like, and, and you know, all of that, it's external validation. It's all based on what other people are going to think of us if we say no. So once I started mm -hmm. to say no to the things that were in that category, it opened up a lot more time for me to be able to fit in some of the wants yeah. <laughs> that yeah, I had to be a lot happier. <laughs> I feel like it's a real hump to get over that no, like you, when you start to get busier and, and things are going, you know, and, and then, and then once you get over it, you're like, it's the most freeing, wonderful feeling to be like, Oh no, like, no, I can't do that. And I'm sticking true. If it's not getting me closer to this thing that I'm going for, whether it's any of those things you just mentioned or something else, then it's like that it's a no, at least that was been my experience. It, it, it made decision-making easier for me because I had that big picture in mind of, of where I'm going and what I want with my life. And then I'm able to go, yep, this gets it a little bit closer. Nope. This takes from my, as much as it sounds good, it'll be fun. It's not the right fit for, for going where I want to go. Um, yep. gosh, it's there's so much I didn't want to talk to you about, but it's when you talk about that, that external validation, it's so funny. Um, Every time I go and speak at a school, I'll, at one point I'll have the kids raise their hand and go, who here has been told you can't do something? In every room I've been to everywhere in the country over a decade, 99% of people will raise their hand. And a lot of times they'll be like, it was him today, <laughs> or it'll be like, it, all the time. And that's something that's been really interesting to observe because like you said, it's the same with adults. It's like the, the watches we wear, the cars we drive, the places we live, the people we date, it, it, it becomes to be to proving to other people. So if someone is having trouble, and I think every person can struggle with this, with caring too much about what other people think, what would you urge them to do to make that mindset shift? I would have you ask yourself, where's that coming from? And it's usually coming from something in your past. It's usually coming from a message that was told to you at a very young age that then became a thought that then became a fact when in reality, it's not true. And so yeah. when you can go back and reflect in something that has transformed my parenting, transformed my parenting, I cannot stress this enough, was addressing what was going on with me rather than what was going on with the kids. So yeah. whether they're always having meltdowns or they're uh, upset about this or they seem like they're be acting spoiled, not focusing on that, but what about that behavior is making me so upset? And then when I was able to handle it in a really calm way, then they didn't have the kind of meltdowns that they were having. And what that taught me is, you know, once I was able to do good work for myself and become the best mom I could be, the kids mirror that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and early yeah. on, they're just kids. They're waiting yeah. to like see themselves in us. They're just like, yeah. show <laughs> us, show us, show us. And you know, it's something for me that has just been such a relief to know, like if I can just ask myself where that's coming from, like what message was sent along the way that put that false fact in my mind and unpack that if I want to throw in a corporate term. Uh, if, if really you would do the internal work, I think that you're going to see such a big change on that seeking of external validation. Yeah. Easier said than done. It would is. you, would you say easier said than done working? Internal work is about the hardest thing that we ever do. And some people spend their entire life doing it. I, I, I can count 20 years I've spent on internal work yeah. and continue to do it. So when I say it's hard work, I mean, it's, um, the most important work, which is always the hardest of work. Yeah. But 
that's the kind that you see the most results, right? You, th you think in business, the best things that happen in your business aren't the easy things. It's the hardest things that you do. And if you're an entrepreneur and you're listening to this, you know. And if you are a W-2 and you can't handle the hard work, do not become an entrepreneur <laughs> because yeah. there'll be so <laughs> yeah. many reasons not to stay doing it. You'll constantly be given reasons to quit and to stop. And, you know, it's um, the hardest of work that you see the biggest of results. Yeah. Yeah, if it was easy, everyone would do it. It does oh, look yeah. pretty glamorous and amazing on the outside. On, on Instagram, being an entrepreneur looks pretty awesome, but that's definitely not the reality, huh? <laughs> no, it's not. And that's the best part of being an entrepreneur and why when you meet other entrepreneurs, you're in this sort of like, you know, wink, like, I got you. you, you you're like me. You can do big things. You can fail. You can be embarrassed you can fall on your face and that's okay. And that's a really great group to be a part of. It's a good audience. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, so I want to know, you have two podcasts. Can you tell us a little bit about those? And, and then I want to hear about some of your favorite guests on there, but yeah. So the two parenting podcasts, what's the deal with them? Yeah. You know, I, it's so funny because when I left the business, I started a consulting company and a coaching program to help people become really good on camera or on stage or in social media. And there was still a piece of me that missed that interviewing. So my kindergarten report card said, Lynn asks too many questions. <laughs> and so um, Munchkin, the baby brand, reached out to me and they wanted me to host a podcast. And this was a couple of years ago. And I just fell in love with this space of long form storytelling. People get so much more information. And so we were able to dig into all of the topics anywhere from what to do if you have a picky eater to, you know, what to do if you have an entitled child. And mm. I felt like, and I'm sure you feel this way, having a yeah. podcast that focuses on parents and parenting, it is, we get to learn, like as the host, it's like the bonus, as the listener, we hope, seat. oh my God, it's the best, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is, it is, I'm just like, this is a front row seat at the master class. That is exactly right, and I have been blown away by, I, it's hard to pick, um, but one really stands out to me because I think she's just her philosophy is it blows me away. Dr. Siggy, if you follow her on social media, she has a really just unique style. You know, a lot of people call it gentle parenting or peaceful parenting or whatever it is um, that is the buzzword. But it also gets a bad rap on social media because it makes you seem like you're soft on your kids and you're not disciplining them. And it's quite the opposite. It's setting boundaries without the shame. And so that was a really eye-opening thing for me to see and a style of parenting where you can still set firm boundaries, but respect feelings, emotions, help to identify where those come from, set clear boundaries without exceptions so that there's safety because children crave safety and without boundaries and consequences, then they are tending to feel unsafe and then they'll act out in unsafe ways. So mm -hmm. she was one of the guests that really blew me away. Our podcast is called Stroller Coaster, which is, I can't even, cannot take credit for that name. I was hired by Munchkin. Uh, they are brilliant <laughs> in, in the, the Stroller Coaster name. Uh, and then I host a podcast for Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, also a parenting podcast that is focused for all ages, where we really dig into the deepest of topics. And sometimes it's hard for anyone, you know, that's, that's, wanting to shine a light on these topics that need to be discussed, like teen suicide, which I, you know, I know is very sensitive topic. I want to, you know, warn people when you talk about things like that. And I always like to put something on that of just how significant it is to talk about the solution associated with it. There is a problem right now that is happening with teenagers with anxiety, depression, and in turn suicide that has to be addressed. It just yeah. has to be. And if we don't, we are failing our children. Yeah. And it's what's beautiful about this hospital that they're really, that's just one of the topics, but they are really yeah. working to highlight some of the biggest issues that are happening with our youth right now. 
Yeah, man, it is a tough, I do not envy these kids by any means growing up in this world. You know, it, it was a different thing when we were growing up and like, you're kind of reverted back to it a little bit, but being outside and not having everyone knowing every mistake that you've made because someone filmed it or, or put it out into the world. And it, it feels like a lot of times that kids can't be kids um, and they're comparing themselves. We had a girl the other day who's like got a beautiful singing voice and she uh, was like, I'm not going to sing anymore because I'll never be as good as Taylor Swift. Mm. And it's like, well, what are these comparisons? <laughs> this is the most famous singer possibly on the planet today right now. And guess what? You, you could be better than she was at your age, you know, but she's just been doing it for a, a long time. But that's like the type of level that a lot of times these kids are, are feeling and seeing. Have you talked much on either of your podcasts about the phone and social media. Mm -hmm. What are, what are some things that, that you've learned or, or seen in your uh, front row masterclass? Big time because I've struggled with what's that right number, right? My, my son has been asking for a phone for a couple of years. He's got friends that have phones. We yeah. compromised and we did one of those watches where he could call us. Um, but I feel really strongly about the impact of social media. And I say that because I started reporting on studies that were coming out years before it actually was being talked about, that yeah. it is evident that we are giving them the equivalent of cocaine when it comes yeah. to social media. It was designed that way. And now we see the research that's come out, you know, 10, 15 years later, validating those fears. But I had known it from a very early start. And yeah. so my five-year-old was in the car and he hears these phrases, TikTok, right? And they all, they want an iPad. And I actually, I reported on the iPad debuting. And I remember all yeah. of us waiting yeah. for the debut of it. And we were like, iPad, what a weird name. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, it turned out to be a global phenomenon and nobody, when they were just giving their kids devices, even thought that there could be anything wrong with that. What could be wrong with that? We didn't have any evidence to prove that. And yeah. so it's given me enough of a pause to say there need to be deep conversations that come with it. So it's not like my kid doesn't grab a you know, iPad when we're on a plane. No, I'm not one of those kinds of parents, but it's a thoughtful conversation that I explain to them why I'm hesitant to give them a free for all when it comes to devices, that these are things that require an understanding of some of the great things and some of the not so great things that you don't get full um, access to these types of things until you're old enough to really take them seriously and the dangers of them. So it's all about the conversations and you can have conversations yeah. with your kids, you know, as early as three, four years old, it just has to be dumbed down to a really, really basic level. I used to say, <laughs> you know, no, we don't have an iPad because it can turn, you know, your brain gets mushy. Your brain, yeah. you know, your brain's not working hard when you're, <laughs> when you're just watching a screen, it gets mushy. Just trying to give them um, a visual of why. Yeah. There's a warning. Um, so those are just some things that I've taken away of just proceed with caution, which everybody obviously is doing, but set the boundaries that are so age appropriate. And there's so many resources out there. And then yeah. look for the warning signs when you yeah. look for your, when your teens are withdrawing, when they're not talking to their friends because they're only talking on social media. And those warning signs have to be addressed. And yeah. the earlier, the better, because there are ways to reach your kids before it gets to a point where there's no return. Oh, yeah. Once they're going full steam ahead on it, it's hard to put it back into the yes. bottle, right? They're going, the, the toothpaste is out of the tube. And, yes. and, and then it doesn't help that all the other kids' parents are letting them do these things. And so they're like, but every other kid has Hard Snapchat. Every other kid, that's, that's the way that they're community. There's a group chat and it's like, well, you're not going to be a part of it because we don't want you to have that mushy brain. But yeah. again, that's another one of those easier said than done, but choose or your heart, like, right? Yeah. And I, and it's kind of similar to when my kids will be like, well, so-and-so has this, whatever, insert like electric s scooter or whatever it is. And it's the idea of like in parenting, and we need to practice this as adults, can we think about there's always going to be people that have more than us. There are always going to be people, be people that have a lot less than us. How can we find pure satisfaction in what it is that we do have? 
like mm. aspirations of more is wanting, like always wanting. You'll never satisfy that. It is satisfaction in what you do have. It's a hard concept for kids to get their heads around, teens especially, because there's always going to be somebody who turns 16 and gets a fancy car. Yeah. And, you know, that's not going to be my kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just not. I want them to be able to earn it. I want them to be able to, like, sell mud minnows over by the dock and be like, yeah, I saved up hundreds of dollars to get this junky car as long as it's safe. You know, there's, like, some, yeah. some real life lessons in that that are really important. Yeah, they need that. I live they... at the beach. That's why I give the mud minnow example. <laughs> <laughs> we're, near the, we're near the beach. I live on the coast. <laughs> That's too funny. Yeah, it is. It is something that this world that we live in right now. It is, uh, you know, like we said, I don't envy these kids having to navigate all these yeah. things. And as parents, it's so much on your plate because it's like, what is this new thing? I've never even heard of it a month ago. And now I have to, this is the new thing that could be killing them or distracting them. But I love that focusing on what you do have. And I honestly feel like a lot of times today when we meet somebody new or you come across someone that you're interested in, in um, maybe working with or doing something, I'll go straight to their social media and I'll look at it, and in five seconds, I could be like, "Oh yeah, this is a person I would never want to spend time around." Um, they're, you know, constantly seeking validation externally. They need attention, and it's like, and it sucks because sometimes it'll be someone that was like, "Oh, that was such a nice person. I thought they were so great," and then you see how they are on the internet, and you're like, uh, "Not really something that I want to be associated with." I think there's a little bit of a lack of a maturity. Um, and also I think the, the crazy thing about social media is it allows you just to see people's full on mental illnesses. Um, and it's, cele- right. it's celebrated. It's celebrated. Like, oh, honey, don't do that. Don't do that. Put the phone down. I yeah, know yeah. it is. You're right. It's celebrated. Yeah. It, it, it's uh, oh, good for you. It's empowering. It's like, no, I don't think that's going to get you the, the husband or, or wife or, or friends or business partner, or honestly, just the inner happiness and fulfillment that you're looking for. Right. So uh, I love that. So what is one more um, favorite yeah. guest that you've had on, on either of your two podcasts when it comes to something that maybe you learned? I know uh, yeah. that peaceful parenting, I've done some conversations as well, and kind of what you're saying I thought I was going to disagree with uh, them. I was kind of ready to be like, all right, I got some pushback. And when, when I talked to him, I was like, I actually pretty much am on board with most of this. You're just kind of reframing it a little bit. And it's just like you said, being very, I would say intentional beforehand, get ahead of it. Like it's way easier if you get ahead of it and have a plan and communicate. Um, but, but anyways, that, that's my, my little uh, rant. What about you for a couple of awesome guests that you've had? The other piece that on Stroller Coaster that really resonated with me is is dealing with children with big feelings and big emotions and what to do with that. I have a big feeling, big emotion kid. I'm a big feeling, big emotion person. Those <laughs> two things can really collide because you both don't know how and, and one is the parent, right? So that's the one that needs to really actually be there. And so in that episode, one of the biggest takeaways that I alluded to a little bit earlier, but this is the episode that we talked about it, is you can't parent unless you've parented yourself. You can't parent unless you have regulated. And that means sometimes walking out of the situation and walking away from it and tag teaming in your partner and being like, I, I, and I've done that before to my husband. I've been like, I, I, I gotta, I gotta walk out and I'll go for a walk or I'll just go upstairs. And a lot of people don't have that partner. So you need to find that army around you that can be that support system. And if you don't have that army and you really feel like you're on your own, you still can do it because you can set those limits with your kids and say, guys, everybody into their own rooms. I need a minute and take that minute to regulate yourself because you can't parent until you're at that place where you can be calm, you can be logical and take away the piece that was difficult for me. I'll be totally transparent, like the screaming, right? Get in your room, get upstairs because nobody's listening to you. So you feel like you have to raise your voice. And what I learned in another episode is screaming is actually worse than hitting. And I didn't, I, I, I was not aware of that. Like actually screaming 
has more of an impact psychologically on our kids than hitting. Mm. Obviously, both horrible. We would never yeah. do that. But yeah. a lot of people scream. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not Thankfully, there's not as much of the other, but a lot of people scream. And yeah. so some of the techniques that, that I, I put in place to do that um, were like, what is it that's getting me so upset? Why am I so mm-hmm. upset by this behavior? Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's all back to that center of what is the internal work that we have? Like, mm. and, and like you said, it's hard, but is there any better hard work to have than knowing that you're giving your kids that safe space, the place that they know that that person that's their safe space is regulated and in control? Because if that mm. person's not in control, whew, scary stuff. <laughs> yeah. Can you believe they let parents be parents without passing yeah. some sort of test or, or something like how, it, there's so much to this. It, it's nearly impossible. And, and you just can, you could just do it. You, you don't have, you don't have to pass the test. Yeah. I also feel like my son's schools think I'm seriously underqualified for this position. <laughs> like, really? I'll, I like... forget everything and they never are dressed up for the spirit weeks or I'm lunches in the refrigerator, not in their backpack or Lynn, <laughs> didn't you remember this? And it's just like, right. Yeah. I forgot that again. Yeah. And give yourself grace, give it, give ourselves grace that if we're trying, then we're great parents. That's all it is to it. Like, yeah, so it, that's you're, the showing up, you're showing, showing up, up consistently. Yeah, yeah, man, it is, it, it is a lot. I'm curious if we could kind of um, intersect the two here of entrepreneurship and kids. What if a parent has a kid who maybe shows a little bit of the entrepreneur bug? Do you have any recommendations or things that they might recognize and how you can encourage and foster them if that's something Uh, that they see in their kid? I love that question. I love it because I think that we're going to be, this is like Gen A, okay, after Gen Z. And (laughs) these are going to be some serious entrepreneurs. They're witnessing everywhere that a lot of people are finding really big fulfillment when it comes to being their own boss and that they can have mm, a big, big, big impact. They just have to have the character and the principles in order to be accomplished and succeed, which as we discussed in the beginning is a huge piece of it. So I've seen this in both of my boys, more so my oldest, because obviously him being the older one, it's, it's, you know, going to be more prevalent, but both my husband and I are entrepreneurs. My husband actually inspired me to become one because I was a, you know, corporate America person for 20 years. And I got to see firsthand the benefits and the hardships of entrepreneurship. And so he inspired me. So now having a parent or having two parents that are entrepreneurs, he has a lemonade stand, for example. Right. And so my husband's like trying to explain to him cost of goods. And so he's like, you know, well, you, you got to take that money and go buy more lemonade so that you can sell it. So how much did you spend on the lemonade? And he's like, no, dad, you, you go, you go buy me the lemonade. And it's he's like, good. No, he's good. good. Yeah. He's real good. No, see, you just made some money and now you put it back in the business. So you're going to spend 10 bucks on that lemonade, but you're going to make some good money. And let's talk about, so say you make a hundred dollars on that $10 of lemonade, how much money did you make? So it's kind of like those conversations that you have with them to understand the basic principles and why entrepreneurship can be so just life changing for people if they, if they know how to do it. Um, and why we wanted to encourage that at such an early age. So whether that's a lemonade stand or literally like here, we have a real need. We live in a beach community, as I mentioned, and there's a dock where people go and they have to drive into town to get bait and it's really expensive because it's touristy. So we can go and catch bait and it's a ton of it and we can sell it at much cheaper price, but we make a lot of money. And so those conversations, and I see his brain working like, oh, I get it. Entrepreneurship solves a problem and you have to have value for the person that's buying it and the reason they choose you. Those conversations you can totally have with your kids. So if you're starting to see that they have an interest in it, foster it. Don't push your kids into a square hole. If there's 
a round peg or round peg into a square hole, whatever it is, don't push them into something because they're not going to be fulfilled. And if they're not fulfilled and they don't find purpose, they're not going to be successful. So you may want a lawyer or a doctor or a CEO in corporate America, but they're going to be miserable and they're probably going to drop out. (laughs) So foster it and see just how beautiful it can be. I feel like I see a lot of that too, of parents who project what they wanted. They were the star athlete or they were this, uh, you know, or that, and they're forcing this on the kid and the kid's like, I, how obvious I don't, this isn't what I want to be. I want to be my own person. And so I guess that's something too, when it comes to this, you can, I think you have to see it in them. You can have those conversations, right? But also don't force it on them. If it's not their thing, you know, that's, that's okay too. <laughs> yeah. And I've had this conversation because I mentor some young, whether it's Girl Scouts or young um, military veterans in journalism and things like that. And I've, I always ask the question, you know, why do you want to do this? Like, why, mm. why take so much work on why? And I hear that a lot of like, oh, well, my mom did this or my dad did this. Well, why do you want to do it? Well, it makes them happy or all all these things. And it's just that that pattern made me realize to exactly your point that that's out there. And what can we do as parents to let go? Because it really has to be a piece of letting go of control. It is Mm -hmm. a control piece because and I see it with so many people parents of teens that are trying to get their kids resumes so padded because it's so competitive to get into school and so expensive. So unless you get a scholarship, but let me tell you what we're seeing as a result of it, kids who are way over anxious and depressed and they're burnt out by the time they get to college and then they're not even what you want them to be. So they're at a great college and then they don't become what you're hoping for, which is successful. And so we've, uh, we've seen it over and over again. I don't know how long it's going to take for some people to realize that you have to let your children choose their paths when you give them the guardrails, right? Like you can't choose the path (laughs) that you get to go eat popcorn and watch movies and do something that's not healthy for you. But they don't have to be in five sports and travel this and travel that when they're saying to you, I'm tired, I'm hurt. Yeah. I mean, I, we've got 10-year-old kids in these travel teams that their their shoulders shot. Yeah. I mean, yeah. how do yeah. you get here, right? Yeah. 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 And so it's, it's a huge, um, I think, more parenting issue than it is child issue. Yeah, 100% agree. I'm curious, would you mind sharing one of your success stories of someone that you've worked with and coached in the entrepreneurial space for adults um, of just a transformation, whether it's a small thing, like they just found their voice and were willing to share their story, or if it's a, you know, whatever, could you share uh, one or two of those? I have a number of them, but um, one in particular comes to mind. So she has been a client of mine for the past two years, which is a reminder that there's always up leveling to be done. But when she first came to me, I mean, she'd never been on TV, never been on a stage, but she was an incredible expert and entrepreneur and had a really incredible message as well. Um, And fast forward, she now has the Today Show reach out to us to have her on. (laughs) <laughs> she was featured. She's a workplace culture expert. And there are a couple things that happened along the way. One, it was learning the basics of what it is that makes someone really good on TV. But then it was cultivating the relationships in the industry once she was booked in a number of places. And what that has done is completely transformed her career, right? She's now speaking on stages all over. She has a TEDx talk that's just come out, um, working on a book. And, you know, the whole goal, right? And for many of these entrepreneurs is to be able to exit at a certain point. And so to be able to see the transformation of somebody that has never even known something to be possible to not only is it possible, but it's, it's desired by the market. They want you, you know, you become the lure for them. They're reaching out to you. So that's something in the TV space. And then another person that comes to mind, not necessarily because not everybody wants to be on TV or wants to make media appearances, but they do want to have a podcast or they want to start a YouTube channel or they want to get out there on social media. And one of my clients, you know, had been corporate America for a really long time and wanted to become an entrepreneur and didn't have the confidence to be able to do it. And when we 
went through the process. She's now not only an incredibly successful entrepreneur, but she is a leading voice in AI, which when we started mm-hmm. working together, it had not even really exploded in the way that it, it has now. Yeah, and yeah. it's really, she, her biggest fear was putting herself out there as her and not mm. as the corporate executive that had talking points. Yeah, And yeah. the it goes to the confidence thing of how do we believe that our message, our voice, and our knowledge is worthy of the masses. And it, it's not an easy thing to do, just like you said, but yeah. the great stuff yeah. doesn't happen through the easy work. It happens through the hard work. And it, if you do it, you can be successful at it. So good. So I want to know for people who want to check out if they can work with you and fulfill the things that they want to do in their life, where's the best place for them to go check out? Is it your website? I would love to even just have you follow on Instagram. So you get some of the, like I do um, mindset Mondays where we try and tackle those mindsets that are holding us back. So even if we don't work together, I just am hoping that some of these messages resonate so that we can all up level. I do it for myself. Like I I have to coach myself and I coach my clients to coach themselves. So I'm at at Lynn Smith TV. My website is lynnsmithtv.com and I do group coaching when it comes to my mastermind called Scale Your Influence, which is on a smaller scale to my one-on-one coaching for people that really are like, I want to get my TEDx. I want to get my TV appearance. So we have something for everyone because the point isn't to go huge, huge, huge. It's to take that first initial step to know your worth. Because Mm -hmm. when you know your worth, then you're able to give back and give that energy out there to others so that they can learn, they become better. So in you becoming better, others are becoming better. And if we just focused on that and stopped arguing and screaming at each other, how much better would it be for our kids? That's the goal, right? We're doing all of this, that they live in a better world than we do right now. And you were talking about how hard it is to have kids in this time. I try and look at it from the positive. We all agree it's bad. So now we all have to agree to do something about it. That's mm. going to be the positive way of looking at this. And if we all agree to do something about it, which is in completely our control, our kids will end up in a completely different world than what we're living in right now. Mic drop. I think that's <laughs> the way is it starts with you. That's going to be the title of this. Is it starts with you. It starts with you. I That's love right. it. Lynn, this was amazing. Thank what you so pleasure. much for the way you're showing up in the world and helping so many people. I'm really glad we were able to make this to happen today. And uh, I think we'll have to do it again. So Same stay tuned, you, Jesse, everybody. All right. We'll care, see you guys. Everyone.